It's like the stream. <laughs> I think we're live. Let me make sure that we're actually live, and then we'll start. I have this fear that one day I'm going to start a stream and I'm going to have a really interesting conversation, and then I, I'll have forgotten to press the button, and I just haven't started the stream. <laughs> Which, I mean, worse things can happen, but it will still be annoying. Okay, we're live. You could watch the stream in, in parallel. <laughs> you can hear yourself speaking. All right, uh, I'm just yeah, going to do a quick cool. intro. Welcome to the next Max live chat with uh, Moritz. Uh, Moritz is the well, used to be this used to be I should say used to be used to be the CEO of CodeChip, um, which is a CI/CD startup provider provider startup. Uh, until they got acquired by Cloudbees, I think a year ago, two years ago. How long ago was ago. that? Feels yeah. A long time ago, <laughs> more than two years ago. <laughs> uh, a while ago. Months ago, no. yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and yeah, we're here today to uh, chat with him for a little bit about his experiences. Um, so welcome, Moritz. How are you doing? Uh, and also, for context, for those of you who don't know, which probably most people don't know, Moritz and I go skiing together pretty frequently. Um, so we know each other quite <laughs> That's well. That's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Just so people aren't weird out when we have some kind of in-joke. If we say any in-jokes, it's because we know each other. It's not because we're you're, you're left out or anything. Um, exactly. It's really it's really weird though because usually we, we speak German. I don't think we've ever spoken English together. Nope. Nope. That's a new experience. Uh, no. How are you doing? How's how, how's your weekend? How was your how was your week so far? Great. English is actually easier. I, I I struggle sometimes saying things in German, and then I switch to English because I'm so used, especially in in the work context, to talk about it in English. I think I couldn't explain English. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> Especially with technical topics, because all of the exactly. all of all the phrases are English, right? You, and you can't really translate them to German. That doesn't make any sense at all. And so you just end up exactly. speaking half English anyway. Might as well speak English. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever I do interviews in German, I'm like, oh my god, how do I <laughs> <laughs> uh, where do you even start? <laughs> uh, so, what is what is culture? Why why did it start? And sort of how did it come about? Yeah, uh, CodeChip is a SaaS CI/CD platform, uh, so it helps you test and deploy your applications. Uh, we started it, oh, I think nearly ten years ago. Oh I wow! I, I think we we registered our first domain at the end of 2010, so a long time ago. Damn. Uh, and yeah, no, and back then. Um, the world was very, very different. I, I looked at an old presentation that, that we did, I think, in 2012. And back then, I think GitHub had like 800,000 users or something like that, like already a lot of people. <laughs> but compared to now, right, it's like 90. nothing. Exactly. And so back then, I think the world was different and people really struggled with um, having a CICT product that's super easy to use, that just works out of the box. And all the other solutions in the space were quite complicated and you have to set them up yourselves and, 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 and all of that. I think today it's very different, but back then that was a huge problem and that is why we got, got a lot of customers. That makes sense. So back then, were there any CI CD providers that sort of worked like CodeChip where you just have a sandbox? Not really. Not, not really. I think um, CodeChip, Travis, um, Circle, we all started at the, at the same time because I think all like a group of people basically had the same idea, right? It just felt very obvious if, if there's a world where everybody, I mean, for us, it felt like that everybody was already using GitHub, while in reality, that wasn't the case. Yeah. <laughs> but for us, we didn't, didn't know it any better. And um, so it, it always felt like everybody's using cloud and SaaS, and that's the only way to do things. And so it just was very obvious for us that there needs to be a SaaS solution that does this. Um, and so a couple of companies started and a couple of projects got started at the same time, but uh, it was a very different, different time. Landscape back then. There's this interesting concept yeah. called the adjacent possible, which, which uh, I don't know who actually invented it. I read about it in a book called Where Good Ideas Come From. And basically, the idea is that um, in, innovation happens by combining old things in new ways. And so there's always like a yeah. finite set of innovation that can happen. And that is like yeah. the adjacent possible, right? That is sort of what is adjacent to what's currently possible. Um, and I think, I guess, in 2010, yeah. SaaS CI CD providers were in the adjacent possible, right? Which is why so many people invented them sort of at the same time or, or started, started them around the same time. Yeah, I think, I think it was pretty obvious to some people. <clears throat> um, and as, as you said, right, I think most ideas are actually pretty simple and not very innovative to be, 
to be perfectly honest. <laughs> right? um, and even if you look at something like Slack, right? Slack didn't invent something completely new. Uh, I think Slack in the beginning was a slightly better version of HipChat. HipChat was a slightly better version of IRC, right? It's like slightly better, but then slightly better can can change the world because if you suddenly have right with Slack, I remember when we, we used HipChat back then and Slack just felt magical because like the search was so much better. You had a good mobile app, like like those basic things that now everybody takes for granted felt like a complete game changer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is something we noticed with Spectrum actually, because we were basically building a chat app. And so as soon as you nowadays build a chat app, you just have the expectation that you have the same level of polish as Slack. If you don't have the same level of polish, everybody complains, which is absurd because the level yeah. of polish in Slack is insane. <laughs> yeah, people yeah, people always right it, from the outside it looks like oh there's it's just like a little bit better, a little bit different. It, it obviously requires a ton of work. Right to make something five percent better or one yeah. percent better, and there's this. I don't know when when I saw it, but there was this like flow chart for how like notifications get triggered, right? um, and it's like insanely complex. I'm pretty sure you saw it as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. You do it in a in 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 a good way, and it's just really really hard. I think to build. To yeah, for sure. People underestimate it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Um, but to get back on track, so you, you, it's 2010. Who who do you start coaching with? Who are your? Did, did you do it alone? Did you have co-founders? How did that all begin? Yeah, we were, we were three people and um, um, Flo and Manny were my two co-founders. They are also both from Austria. Um, Flo uh, came up with the original idea, actually. Um, and initially, yeah, because I think it was such a different world back then and we didn't, didn't know really anything about building, building companies and all of that. We just did it on the side for a while. So we just built I think for two years um, on, on weekends and did a little bit of work and we always weren't sure, right? If we, I think our gut feeling told us, well, this makes sense, but then everybody else, except our users and a few other people <laughs> told us that it doesn't make any sense, right? There were, I mean, back then it was so different because so many people were like, well, nobody pays for like tools for developers, right? There aren't enough developers, right? There were all those like insane, <laughs> arguments now if you look back and we were like that doesn't make sense right <laughs> um, but i think it, maybe we lacked a little bit of confidence or maybe i don't know what was the problem but it took us two years until we decided well we should really do this like full time do nothing else um, build a real company out of it and that is also when we decided to move to the us um and i think it was all the right decision it just took us a while um if i could go back i would just do it like with two hundred percent from day one, but it's always easier. Super interesting. Do, right? do you think that hurt you in the long run that you sort of spent the first two years just working on it on the side? I, I I think so, but it's hard to say, right? I mean, there's yeah, of course. Like, when you think about <laughs> build, building a company, right? There's like you make all those decisions, and you sometimes wonder what would have been different if I would have made that decision, and then maybe it would have been completely different, right? You, you just don't know. I sometimes like I wish you could just like save the current state and try out different scenarios like in a computer game <laughs> <laughs> and then quit and load again um things don't play out uh, but it, unfortunately it's not possible in life so i think i think it hurt us but maybe it didn't hurt us right it's also hard if you are like the first company that does something i think we benefited quite a bit because travis um, got a lot of momentum in the open source community right travis in the beginning was just ci uh, that was for free if you're GitHub repo was public. Um, and that I think helped many people understand, well, actually that's really neat. It also makes sense for other projects and not just open source. And, and I think Travis becoming so well known helped us a ton and helped Circle a ton. If we would have, I think, like jumped on it full time, like right away, then that would have been probably a little bit before Travis really took off. And then we would have had to convince a lot of people maybe that would have been harder. Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I just, I think I like to do things quickly and I have a lot of urgency with everything I do. So <laughs> yeah. I'm like, ah, that's a bummer that we for two years just like weren't confident enough uh, because I think that was the issue. Interesting. Okay, so you, you and your two friends, uh, you're, sitting, you're sitting in Austria for two years, you're building coach on the side. Are you seeing some early success or did you just keep plugging away anyway? Yeah, I mean, we, right, we were using it ourselves. We got some early users. I think um, right before B 
we decided to do it full time, we got our first customer. I think that was like the big moment where we were like, well, a lot of people, maybe we talked to the wrong people, but a lot of people told us this doesn't make sense, it's not possible. And I think that's, I think still a little bit the culture in Austria, right? You aren't exactly encouraged to build a company, you're more encouraged to just like do your job and yeah, yeah, right. And, and join like a larger company. It's not like in the US where so many people are starting companies all the time and you have many role models. I think that was, and it still is different in Austria. Um, so I think for us, a lot changed. And for me personally, a lot changed when we got our first customer because then we were like, well, we had those people using it for free. And now we forced them to pay and they are paying. So I mean, it doesn't matter actually what other people say. Like something seems to be working because if a random person that, that we don't even know suddenly base for the thing we build, I mean, it must create some value, right? And I think that then made us confident enough to say, okay, we do it full down and, and try to move to the US. And that makes sense. So basically, think, as soon as you were making money, you were like, this is valuable to people. So let's just move. Yeah. Yeah. Hold which on, I think is. Yeah, go. Yeah, good. No, I think it's, I mean, it's also a good way to do it, right? Um, I mean, if I would start a new company now, and I would be far more confident. I think that whole experience that I took away from it is I'm much more confident in my own ideas, which may be sometimes painful for other people because I'm like, look, I, I think this makes sense. <laughs> and you can argue against it all day long. I still think it makes sense. I'm not like stubborn and don't take input, but I think if you go for this experience of many people told you it doesn't make sense, you did it and it made sense. And then it, it's so obvious that it made sense. I think you just become so much more confident um, in your own opinion and your own gut feeling. And also, I guess it sort of proves that it doesn't matter what, what people tell you, right? It's more important what they actually, if they take out their wallet in a sense, right? Like exactly. They, I think options always matter more than words. Exactly. Yeah. That's really what, that's really what matters. So really the only way you kind of figure out if your idea is valuable is if you build it and then if people pay for it and if they don't, they don't. Exactly. Right. Like there's, exactly, exactly. you can argue about it from first principles forever, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter if people end up paying for it. Exactly. Exactly. And so then, so you 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 have your startup. You you've built it for two years on the side. You decide you have your first customer. You decide to go full time. Why do you move to the US? How how did that come about? Yeah, it, it goes back to the like, a lot of people. I think told us it doesn't make sense. I think we at that point pretty much exhausted um, <laughs> our personal network and like friends and companies we knew in Austria that we could talk to, um, and it just felt like we won't get. Do anything here right what's the right if you objectively look at what's the best place i think it's now changing with companies finally buying into uh remote work but i think the best place to start a company is probably a software company is probably not in austria right if you objectively <laughs> like pick the best place and, and prioritize everything that i always say like if you want to become a professional ski racer you would try to be in Austria, right? Austria makes sense. You won't like move to South Africa and try to become a downhill racer. <laughs> but, but if you build a company, right? The US just makes more sense. And this makes a lot of sense, right? There's Boston, New York, there are other startup and technology apps. So we felt that if we would move, we would be closer to other successful founders, right? Which then A, um, helps you get better faster because I believe that you are the average of the people you spend the most time with, right? So if you spend time with people who tell you, no, this won't work, I think you are also becoming a little bit like that. Um, if you spend um, a lot of time with people that are insanely successful and build companies before, I think you're, I think you're just inspired to try harder and aim for something bigger, right? If you are building, and I mean, I love Austria, I'm in Austria right now, beautiful country and, and, and lovely people. But if you are, if you look around in Austria, like what's the biggest software company here, right? You're, it's fairly easy to be a success in Austria, right? And it's fairly easy to be a successful ski racer in South Africa, right? It's like that local maxima, which I think hurts you a lot. And the US felt the place to be where we are forced to become better because nobody, right? I think in Austria, we, we felt we already like, oh, we raised some money and we have customers. Like people were already like, you like you made it. And you're like, what? <laughs> right? While in the US, I mean, even if you're insanely successful and have like thousands of customers and like millions or hundreds of millions in revenue, you're still like, well, they're all those other companies were so much more successful. 
right? To do so much more and so much better and build better products and have happier customers. And, and, and so you just inspire, aspire to do better. And that was probably the biggest reason why we decided, look, if we prioritize everything based on that, we should move to the US. That makes a ton of sense from the, it's, it's kind of interesting that you mentioned that because I've seen a couple of pitch decks from Austrian startups. Um, and usually they're way less ambitious than the pitch decks you yeah. get in like Silicon Valley. Like, like 10 orders of magnitude less ambitious, I think. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to do this for like four years and then we're going to have a valuation of $20 million and then we're going to sell. And if you, yeah. if you tell that to a VC in, in Silicon Valley, they're going to laugh you out of the room because exactly. they're looking for the next Airbnb, right? Like they're looking for the next thing to change the world. You, you basically are trying to prove to them that your thing is going to be the next big thing that everybody uses, right? And yeah. It's, yeah, that's key. It's exactly game. that, right? It's like Austrian companies almost optimize for this local maxima that, that that sort of is exemplified here because nobody really starts companies, right? It's not like a common thing to do. Um, exactly. So that makes a ton of sense. Did it actually end up working out that way? Did you actually move to the US and hang out with a bunch of really cool company building people? Yeah, and it totally worked out. It, it took us a while, so I think we decided that we'll do that like in, in August or September 2012. And then the first thing we did is we moved to Berlin because we didn't know how to best move to the US and visa and all of that and where to move. Um, and we got some free office space in Berlin. And so we were like, Berlin is already better than, on, than Vienna, <laughs> right? <laughs> we don't know many people there, so we can talk to a lot of potential customers and they are already, right, there were larger companies there, right? I remember back then SoundCloud was like a huge thing. I mean, it's still a cool thing, but they didn't <laughs> exactly be as successful as they wanted to be or could have been probably. but. There were just like Berlin felt like, all right, it's like 10 times bigger than, than Vienna. So let's move there. And then we were there for, I think, three months. And then uh, we moved to Boston. And I mean, I never moved back. So I, I think it worked out. <laughs> nice. So why, why did you decide on Boston out of, out of San Francisco, New York, and Boston? And yeah, it was. it was San Francisco or, or Boston. Um, we felt Boston um, made sense for several reasons. Um, a, it's a very, enterprise, um, right? If you look at the, the startup tech landscape in Boston, it's very enterprise focused. I think there's like biotech and, and, and life science and then enterprise uh, software that's like Boston. Uh, it's closer to Europe. So it made sense for us because we felt like we will always have like an office or people in Austria. And that's like great for us because we can hire people here or in other places in Europe. And then the time difference uh, isn't um, as much a problem with six hours versus nine hours. Plus we got um, an investment and, and we participated in Techstars, which was the main reason why we ended up in Boston probably because we felt like, well, if we move to the US and we don't know anybody, it will take us quite some time, right? We have to build up network and we have to get to know people and everything is just harder. And with Techstars, it felt like they would kickstart um, and accelerate. And that was definitely true because it was so much easier. I mean. I remember, I think they, they told us in in January, at the end of January or something that that they would invest and we moved two weeks later. It was just such a nice forcing function and they helped with a ton of stuff. So I think we optimized for speed and Boston uh, helped there. I'm not sure if I would move to San Francisco if we could go back. I mean, San Francisco has many, many advantages for if we could develop for startups. If I would start a new company now, I would probably move to San Francisco even despite COVID craziness. Yeah, yeah, right, that makes sense. Would you would you go through another accelerator or was it? Uh, no. no, no, that makes no sense, I think, to do it twice. Um, or maybe, maybe it does in very specific circumstances. I think where it might, why it made sense for us is, again, it helped us move to the US faster and just get a network at all of that. Um, and then I think if you're a first time founder, it's basically like school right? You, you, you get taught how to build a company, right? I mean, you don't know any, I mean, you learn from other people, um, you read books and blog posts, right? Or stuff on Twitter, but I, I felt it helped us at all to just understand what it means to build a company. And it helped me as a CEO to understand how, how to run a company, right? Change that mindset from, oh, we are, we are free friends. And then we hired other people and we were very close to like, well, there's one person that at the end of the day makes all the decisions, um, which I think is, I, I don't know, I was 22, I think back then it helped quite a bit to get taught that mindset and learn from people who did it before. That was, I think the biggest 
personal benefit from it. That's super interesting. Did you have any sort of conflicts with your co-founders? Did that happen? Oh, I think we had a, we had a don. Um, <laughs> it's just not, that's just normal. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't I didn't want to make it sound that way, just in case you were the exception. But it seems like that's a normal. Yeah, it's not yesterday. Flo and I argued on, on, on Twitter about Austrian politics. <laughs> <laughs> and then like longer on WhatsApp. So I think <laughs> they just like to do that. But no, I think it's normal, right? And what we did is right, we like when we moved to Berlin, one big reason for us was that we said we need to make the shift from we did it on the side for two years to like our life depends on it, right? We need to make more money, otherwise we can't, right? I mean we saved some money, but at some point we can't do it. Um, if you don't make more money. So that forcing function was great, but we did this, we also lived together in Berlin and then we lived together in Boston. Um, so naturally you have more conflicts because you can't avoid conflicts, which I think is awesome because it builds a stronger team, right? There was no, oh, we are pissed at each other or we disagree and then we go home, right? And we don't see each other for a bit and then we come back to Berlin the next day <laughs> and try to just ignore the problem and you move on. That's not possible. if you like work all day and then you go home <laughs> and you hang out because all the people you know are the people you work with because you just moved to a different country, a different continent. So we had a lot of conflicts, but uh, I think it helped us to, to become a much, much, much stronger team. And I think it formed the culture of the company a lot because we were very focused on just openly talking about issues and giving feedback and improving. And I think that was a thing maybe because we were just thinking like that, but also because we always did it like that, right? Um, because there was no other way. That's super interesting. I, I sort of had the same experience with Spectrum. We were remote. Um, I was the only one in Austria and Bryn and Brian were in SF. And it wasn't, it was less of a problem information wise. Like we did a pretty good job of communicating the important mm -hmm. information, but it's just not the same. Like the times that I flew to the US and we just hung out in person for like yeah. weeks on end, were the most creative and the most fast moving that we ever had, right? And in yeah. hindsight, I should yeah. have just moved because it would have saved us so much time and so much conflict or not conflict. It wouldn't have saved us conflict, but it would have helped us resolve conflicts more quickly and move on to the next thing rather than spending. It yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, I'm super bullish on remote first and I coach up in the beginning, right? With an office in Boston and then Vienna and then eventually we just did remote first. Um, and cloud business is very distributed, but I still think, um, and my next company will probably be distributed, but I still think that especially in the beginning, um, it makes sense to spend a lot of time together just to understand the other person better, understand how the other person thinks, the personality, right? Everybody's different, um, expresses things different. It's just easier to figure that out in person. And we, we still do that at cloud business with teams and before COVID where we bring them together on purpose. Although, I mean, you could discuss many things online, but it just helps when you build a new team, hire new people, that you bring them together and just yeah. hang out and have dinner and talk about non-work stuff. And you just understand, right, the, I always call it the operating system of the other person, right? How does the brain work? Um, how do they express things? What do they care about? Because everything is influenced by that. And it's just easier to do it in person. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Did you know your co-founders before you started coaching? I knew Flo um, a bit because uh, from my like, previous company, work stuff, startup-ish thing, and he knew many because I think they went to school together um, and worked together a bit before. Uh, so Flo knew both of us. I only knew Flo. Um, and then we got to know each other quite a bit um, over the first two years, but then I think the working, living together. <laughs> <laughs> it accelerated. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can probably imagine. painful for everybody. But. So if you start another company, will you do it sort of distributed from the from the first minute? Or would you be, would you do the same thing where you're sort of in the same room at the beginning and then eventually hire people outside of that hub? Uh, probably remote from the beginning, but try to bring people together a lot in the first couple of months. I, I think it, it really depends on like the product, the company, the problem. Yeah, I enough. think before you achieve product market fit and like you see that the problem you're solving in the way you're solving it really moves the needle. I think until then it's easier if you're not 
do distribute it. Um, I think it could still work if you are not in the same spot all the time, but I wouldn't do it probably with nine hours time difference. That seems yeah, yeah. hard, right? Yeah. It's just, there's so much you need to discuss and play through uh, that it's easier, I think, if you have more time overlap and then enough time together. But it depends on so many variables, right? How well do I know the people with whom I would do it? If it's people I worked with in the past, it, it's like easy. Right. If it's like coaching people or people here, help it, it would be easy because we know each other. We know how to work remotely together. So that's easy. If it's a completely new team, completely new people, I would try um, to spend a lot of time together. That makes sense. So you're in Boston, you've moved to Boston, you're going through the accelerator, you're meeting all these cool people, you're sort of kickstarting your network <laughs> in Boston. Um, yeah. What happens next? Where do you go from there? You, you go through the accelerator. Did that accelerate just your personal competence or like the company's competence in running a company? Or did that also help you in sort of get customers and grow and build the product better? Yeah, I think, and it's a long time ago. I know what <laughs> I remember vividly is um, our biggest concern with doing an accelerator was that it was just be a huge distraction um, and that we waste like time and also equity company-wise on it. Um, so we were always extremely focused on just building product and working with customers and the accelerator didn't change that. I think we were probably ignoring a lot there and only pick the things that made sense to us. And that's what I always explain to people um, who think about it, right? There are many people who are like, oh, I got accepted into an accelerator. This is awesome. Everything will be great and we'll be successful, right? It's bullshit. You need to do it <laughs> for a very good reason and you need to know why you do it. Otherwise, it won't work out. Um, so we were very, very focused on just building a company and then picked all the things that made sense. Um, I think again, it changed us and made us much more professional as a company, I think, and, and founders and got us into the mindset, okay, it, will, it can really be a huge company, very successful and all of that. And we definitely learned to think bigger because that's, I think, the first thing you learn when you interact more with people in the U.S., uh, I think in the beginning, I remember we already had, I don't know, probably 30 customers or something. And we were so skeptical in the beginning. <laughs> we were like, we're not sure. Yeah, we got some more customers, but maybe this all doesn't work. <laughs> and then we, had, we saw just other founders, like founder after founder. And they were like, they had nothing, like no code written. And they were like, this will be awesome. It will change the world. And we were like, what? <laughs> Like, and then at some point I realized like I always felt like uncomfortable with that, but at some point I realized, well, if we don't talk like them, people don't take us seriously because they think something is wrong, right? They just can't, if you're growing up in the culture and you see people being so enthusiastic and then you meet those weird Austrians who actually achieved already much more and their ideas much more validated and people are paying for it, but they're so skeptical that something must be wrong, right? Yeah, right. Um, and at some point, I, a couple of months, I was like, just like, fuck it. I will just do it like them. And it was, it was amazing because suddenly <laughs> people got so excited about what we are doing. And I was like, this is, this is all like the business is the same. The product is the same. <laughs> we are still the same. I'm just so much more confident than a dog about how we will change the world. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, not change the world and <laughs> make a little bit fun of it. But um, just talking a little bit more yeah, about yeah. the big vision. And, and I think it totally worked out. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. I can totally see that. I think <laughs> it's. Did, did you feel like at the time you had product market fit, like in terms of the. Um, um, I feel. I, product market fit. I mean, back then we didn't. We didn't know it really well, right? I mean, we, we knew about the concept and all of that and talked with other people and right, read like, I don't know, Lean Startup and all, all that stuff. Um, so we feel radical in knew about it but until you went through it once it's very hard like you don't have to, you don't know the feeling <laughs> and and so we weren't sure and then at some point and i think mark and Treason talks about it you know when you don't have it and you know when you have it and there's this odd space in the middle where you're like well I'm not sure but then suddenly it's like yeah right because you just see like more people sign up every day and use it more people pay and then it's like you get like one customer a week and then it's suddenly 10 customers and then it's like a month where you get 200 customers and right somewhere in between you are like well this is obviously working yeah right was there was there right, a, no. was there a specific inflection point did anything happen where you were like oh shit like now it's serious or did it just happen really gradually over time 
Um, I think it happened gradually. Um, I think it was easier to see in retrospect, right? When you compare like, oh, here's where we were at the beginning of the month and here's where we are now. I think it happened probably within that first year in the US uh, where we were like, oh, wow, um, things are really changing. Um, and it probably had a lot to do also with like the market waking up to that idea of you do those things as SaaS and in the cloud and just overall like other companies trying to do the same and just educating everybody and suddenly there's much more momentum in the market and like right GitHub became so much more well known and they raised a lot of money and then suddenly they were very like mainstream and everybody was talking about them while before that it was like this nerdy, <laughs> nerdy thing. I mean, it still is like, for many people, but yeah. Um, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Did, so you, you did the accelerator, you, you found product market fit. Um, suddenly code chip is growing. Now you, you were the CEO, but did, was that sort of a decision that you made at the very beginning? Were you always going to be, the CEO or did you like figure that out along the way? No, we decided that um, right before we, and there was this one meeting, I think it was at Manny's apartment where we were like, what are we going to do? Um, either we like stop it or we do it full time that it came down to the, like those binary choices. Um, and if you do it full time, how would it look like? And then we made a couple of decisions and it's like, move to the US. And we said I would be the CEO um, and the, we, put like everything behind the company and try to see if it works out. So we decided that I think in the summer of 2012, um, yeah. Did that, how did you sort of go about being a CEO in the sense that before that you were what, 22 years old, you said, um, and you didn't really, how, how do you go from being a 22 year old to being the CEO of a successful startup? Like how do you make that transition or, or how do you learn the skills necessary to be a good CEO? Or yeah, I mean, alternatively, I know. Do, do you feel like you were a good CEO? Let, let's go with that first. It's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, don't know. I don't know. I think it, other people need to decide it. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure I suck compared to um, now, but I will say the same in five years and in 10 years, right? You're always getting fair better. Enough. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. I think I was good enough for the moment. If I would have been better, I think we would have been more successful. <laughs> Interesting. Um, and it would have been probably less painful for many people because I just, right, you always try with your best intention. And then I think as a founder, you have like a lot of energy and passion and urgency and you want to do things. And I'm pretty sure I pissed off many people because <laughs> of that. Um, but then you just learn and get better. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, how it works. I think, and I did another company before. It wasn't like a, a, a real tech startup, um, but but in that in that space, I, I knew, and I wasn't the CEO there, but I knew. I think I learned quite a bit about just building teams and leadership there. I didn't know shit compared to now, but <laughs> I think we made some, and like for how inexperienced and young we were, I think we did some things really well, and then others we didn't do well. But I think we we, I mean. If I look back now, I think we, we are all really proud of the, the company we built, how we built it, the culture, um, the people, and despite all the mistakes, I think we, we did some really good things. So I think overall it's positive, although I'm, you can still see I'm highly skeptical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you always have more to learn, right? But I yeah. think, so, so how did you, how did you go about learning to do that? Like what, what sort of taught you to be a whether, whether you call it good or not, to, to be the CEO that you are. Yeah, yeah I think and there, there are a couple of things. Um, so the first one was through that accelerator, I remember what, what happened there is I think every Friday or so, um, all the CEOs met and we just talked through problems. And, and that was super, super helpful because it just, right, we are all fairly not everybody but we are all fairly inexperienced right all first time ceos and so i think we all struggled with similar problems and just talking about it and seeing other people struggle as well and then seeing their approaches to cope with it and, and solve those challenges that helped a lot um what i eventually did that was i think two years or three years later is i got a ceo coach with whom I met, I think every other week, or I still work with him now every every month for an hour. I think that is in, like money very well spent, uh, right? I mean, if you try to become a professional athlete, you have a coach. Um, so I think you should also have a coach for the work you do. Um, 
And then uh, what also helped a lot is after the accelerator program, we, a couple of other CEOs and I, we started a CEO group, which is a fairly common concept, I think in the US, where you just meet like there are groups that are moderated and that cost money, we just did our own, where we just met like once a month for I think four hours and just talked through problems. And everybody was, we put some structure in place so that like everybody gave an update in the beginning and surface problems. And then we just picked, we voted on like, what are the like two problems we now like tackle. And then for an hour, we tackled one problem for another hour, we tackled another problem. And it always happened in a way where we weren't like giving that CEO that spoke up necessarily direct advice. Sometimes we did, but a lot was just like observing, like here is, here's what I would do. Here's what I did. Here's what I saw other people do. And that really helped because it wasn't like you're suddenly on the spot and nine other strong-minded people tell you what to do because that's yeah. also quite exhausting. More like, I just share my experience and you get all that experience in an hour from everybody. And then with all that input, right, you can decide what to do. That was super, super, super helpful. And I did that, I think, for two or three years, um, nearly until the acquisition. So I think all those things help a ton. Um, and I think everybody should do. That makes sense. Do, do you, what do you think were sort of the hardest challenges that you faced as a CEO? Were there any particular moments that, that stick out to you over the 10 years that you were, well, however long it was, seven years that you built Coachip? I think there's no was it just one was it just a constant and, struggle, just a constant? Uh, <laughs> well, I think it, it, it's like, right, everybody says, right, building a company is a roller coaster. I think as a CEO, you're even more exposed to it, right? Um, and you're responsible for all, all of it at the end of the day. So I think you're just experiencing the highs and the lows much more and you take them much more personal because you know at the end of the day, it's your fault if things don't work. Um, so I think there wasn't like one moment. I mean, there were moments where I was like, oh my God, this will never work. And <laughs> was like, this is like the best thing ever. <laughs> um, so you have that. I think the biggest struggle is just that you stay sane <laughs> and don't freak out. I think managing your own mental health, I think is the biggest challenge. And that makes it maybe sense. easier for some people and for other people. And it always felt fairly easy for me, but it's still right. You like you get up in the morning and sometimes you just feel like shit. It doesn't matter when you show up at work. I mean, yes, you should like people should know how you feel as well, right? You're not a robot or anything. But at the end of the day, your job is to lead and manage the company, and your problems don't matter. Um, you're there for the other people, and so you always have to show up. I think in a very very good way, and it's only possible if you figure out okay, how can you be happy despite all the stress. Um, how can you be a good role model? Um, and, and I think that's quite hard. And oh, man. A lot of time to learn. I wish you were there when we were building Spectrum because I th we, we sort of ran into the same thing. A large reason of, I don't want to say that we've, I, I, I mean, I guess we failed because we didn't achieve our goals, but um, sort of a, a large reason for, for why we lost, why we failed was because we lost a ton of momentum. And I think the reason we lost a lot of that momentum is because we lost our own enthusiasm through all the challenges that we faced if that makes sense mm, like yeah um because shit always happens right like something always goes wrong and i think the the thing that i really took away from that experience is that you just always have to stay positive right you just always have to keep cranking because there's no point in being sad or negative about yeah. it right you just have to keep your enthusiasm yeah. because that's what keeps the momentum going and that's what yeah. eventually will make you successful right because you lose your momentum you're gone um yeah I wish you would have told me that back then. I don't know if I would have listened though. I think it's really hard with all of this to sort of know <laughs> know what you should follow and what not to without having done it, right? Um, yeah, and it's also, right, I mean, it comes down to just how you feel about it, right? I mean, yeah. if you are not excited about, right? It's not that you decide I'm excited about this thing and now I'm excited, right? It's like <laughs> a very yeah, personal feeling that's outside of your control to a high degree, so... Um, if you are not excited anymore, maybe it's also just a sign that it's not the right thing to do anymore, right? Because you're just forcing yourself. Yeah, of course, um, of course. So like that is like when right, it's so hard to decide, right? Also when you right when you build a new product, let's say you don't find product market fit, when when is it the right decision to stop, and when is it just another like roller coaster ride, right? I mean, all the successful companies, they all had the really dark moments and they felt it wouldn't work. Um, so it's, 
I don't know if there's any advice to yeah, yeah, yeah. deal with that. Right? Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if anybody did, did you ever consider pivoting or just stopping or doing something else? Um, we never considered, I think fully pivoting. I think we were just lucky because, um, things worked. Um, we weren't, I think the, I remember a point in time early on where we already had paying customers and we weren't really sure why exactly they are paying us <laughs> and we interviewed all our customers to find a pattern, <laughs> uh, because they're like, Right. I mean, there's like, you, you you know the high level reason, but then when you drill into like, why us, why not somebody else, right? At some point, right, we just got customers and then, I don't know, with 50 customers, but we didn't understand why they used our product versus another product. Um, and that drove us crazy because we didn't know, right, like, what should we do next, right? We have all those ideas, like what really moves the needle? And then we interviewed all our customers and... We realized that this really, we always felt it's a weak argument. We focused a lot on simplicity and we got obsessed with how long does it take you to like create an account, connect GitHub, configure your, your, your build, run the build and get the result through email, Slack, etc. Uh, we got obsessed with like just getting that down to the, um, to a to few seconds. But we weren't really sure if that really moves the needle until we moved, interviewed all our customers and they were like, yes, our instinct and gut feeling that great user experience really differentiates was true because even when we had like a couple of thousand customers, people still told us like, we use you because you're simpler. We use you because you have better support. <laughs> and then there was a third reason that was very product specific. Um, and I'm, I'm still not sure if that's good or bad. I'm not sure maybe we should have more like strong product differentiators. Uh, but then it was also, it worked. Yeah. It, it was crazy. It just worked. People love simple products, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a ton of sense to me. Do you reckon, um, in, in okay, I want to talk about the acquisition. So you, you, mm -hmm. you've, you've built this startup. It's basically yeah. successful, right? Um, mm -hmm. We didn't feel it was successful, but <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's what I was assuming. Cause otherwise why would you sell? Right. So, so how did that come? How did that acquisition come about? Why, why did you decide to even, did you look for acquirers? Yeah. Did, they, did they acquire you or? Hey, the perfect honest answer is I think we lost our way a little bit um, because right. And our goal was always that we build a large independent company, right? We never built it to sell the company. Um, we knew from the day we took money, right? That this is the most logical outcome, right? People gave us money, they want more money back, right? <laughs> and then uh, we raised more money and then it was like, well, there is a certain expectation. Um, so we were like fine with that, but it wasn't, right? It wasn't our main driver to do what we were doing. Um, I think what happened is that the problem when you raise more and more money is that the expectations go up and it's awesome. And it was aligned with how we thought about building a company. We were like, well, we rather try to build this as big as possible and have a shot at it and fail than having a higher likelihood to building something average. Um, so we were fine with that. Uh, I think we didn't execute well enough, right? I think if you raise a lot of money, you spend all the money. It's not that you have more time to build your company. You just spend more. If you have more money, you spend more. Um, and that's <laughs> the expectation when you, when you raise money. And that's all fine if you execute perfectly, right? And, and do the things in the right way. But I remember there was a time where we hired people that just didn't, didn't work out. Um, and it was probably because we weren't good in hiring and then we got better, but that just cost us like several months, right? And then you have to let people go again or they leave and then you hire new people. So you just lose a lot of momentum and time um, while you spend all that money. And I think at the end of the day, we were like, well, we got to a certain point, but how do we proceed from here? Right. We were, we were not break even. I think the path to that would have been tricky. Um, I think it would have been possible in retrospect. It just didn't feel like a good path because we're always on this, like, let's go as big as possible. And then just, right. That is the culture you have in the company. And then people didn't get to a culture that's like, let's be like more bootstrap break even while you also have like all those investors in the company that just didn't feel like a good path. Um, raising more money didn't feel like a good path because it would have just, I think, um, 
made the problem bigger, right? Because expectations go up again, you, you spend the money again, <laughs> and, and that didn't feel like a good option. And so we felt like, let's see if we could sell the company and what the interest level would be. And then, then we did that and that worked out. And I think in retrospect, it was the right, it was the right decision. There was also, I think some, we were worried that what happened in our, our specific market was that this like, CICD in the cloud and as a service, many companies did it, right? And now even more companies are doing it, right? I mean, GitHub is, I think, the most prominent example that like really doubled down on it. Um, back then, they weren't doing it. We always felt like they should do it. And we were just like, every year we were like, are they now announcing it? Um, right? And Amazon and Google and all those companies, they all started doing it. So we were like, how long can this go on? Right? If there's so many competitors and good enough products, it will um, force us to have lower prices or a more aggressive free tier. And that then costs us more money, right? Because doing CICD is very resource intense. So it costs you a lot of money. So we're like, how can this all play out, right? We didn't feel like if it just grow slowly that it would stay relevant. Um, and I think that was probably the right decision because I think, but right, if you don't grow, you don't, have enough people to build a really good product, um, then somebody else will just build a better product and that will then be it, the end. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It's it's almost like your your entire market got a little bit commoditized, right? It's, it's almost like yeah. you solved all the hard challenges, but then other people also solved those hard challenges and suddenly there were, you know, dozens of players in the market. Yeah, and it wasn't, at some point, it just wasn't a hard challenge anymore. I, I know when we started, it felt like a hard challenge. And a lot of the technologies, I remember like Docker wasn't there and Docker simplified the problem a lot, like Kubernetes simplified it a lot. There, it was just a different time. Of course, and then yeah. I think you always, which is normal, you always have to adapt and build again a better, newer product or add more capabilities. I think we just didn't move fast enough for whatever reason. So it felt like it's the right decision. Interesting. So you felt like you, you as a company didn't didn't move fast enough. Mm -hmm. Do yeah. you? How do you? In in hindsight, how would you have fixed that if you sort of had to fix it? Like, what do do, do you think you did something wrong, or do you think you just never yeah. reached that sort of point where? It... I think my personal conclusion is that I I think it's it's my fault because I I think I overcorrected from I think we were very very bushy and hardworking in the beginning right because we were like we need to make more money to be able to do this we need to get the company off the ground it was just us founders and then we hired Alex and then we hired uh, more people and we all had this mindset in the beginning I think we pushed really hard I remember after we moved to Boston in the first or in the second month, um, Manny and I got very upset because Flo wanted to take the afternoon off on the weekend. <laughs> what? <laughs> right, so we, I think it, it's not good. It was, right? But I think every, like I know so many other successful founders, right? They all eventually get into a more normal rhythm, right? And they want to be good role models so that their teams don't burn out, but they all worked incredibly hard in the beginning. Um, and I think that's needed to, to get things off the ground if if it would be super easy like everybody would do it so it requires a lot of energy i think it then and i overcorrected to making sure that it's an environment where we don't um push people too hard right we had people who like burned out and um we just i think tried to like i think push them a little bit too hard and then we overcorrected and i overcorrected to we need to make sure people are like really enjoying it and, and all of that. And I think somewhere in between, we lost the focus on, well, this is all great, but you're still constrained by like what's going on in your market and with your customers, right? At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if, I mean, it's great if, if you're not working that much <laughs> um, and if people are happy, right? And don't feel stressed, but if the product doesn't get better and then customers are un unhappy, like what's the, like, how do you, like, how does, how should it work out? It doesn't work out well, I think. Um, so I think that was probably, if I could change one thing, it would be that. Super interesting. Huh. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have thought that from the outside. Like I wouldn't have thought that that was going to be the problem, but it's interesting. So essentially you're saying you created a too soft environment in a way, right? 
inside yeah, the company? Because, because we were like, well, it's like bad how hard we pushed, right? In, in the beginning, we worked hard. So that was the culture. We pushed everybody else to do it. And there was always like, right, founders have to work hard and all of that. But yeah, like, yeah. we were always, we always had that role model. Um, and so everybody was hardworking. I think at some point it just didn't work, right? If you hire your like employee number 20, for them, it's just much more a normal job, um, which is totally okay. Uh, I think then some of those people struggled, we over course corrected um, and didn't find that happy medium. And now I'm just like, look, it requires a lot of work. It's not for everybody. Let's find the right people and be very upfront and honest, right? Creating something new from scratch, it's hard. Yeah, Doesn't that makes a ton of sense. Seven days, seven days a week, right? It's super important that to take time off and all of that. But at the end of the day, it's it's not your it's not your average job. You have to make sacrifices if you want to start from something from scratch, and if you want to be part of that. And I know it's different for employees than founders, and they don't share the same upside. But it's still it's different. And it might yeah. not be for you. That's totally okay. That makes a lot of sense. So I I before we end, I want to go back to the acquisition because I want to know what that felt like for you. Did as as a CEO, you were so I assume the main point person running the whole process. From yeah, from and we also yeah, and we also and because we had investors on our board and yeah, of course, and all yeah. of that. We also hired um um a firm that helped us with that um and uh, and bankers that helped us with that, but it, I, I did a lot of the work and it was super stressful. Um, but at the end of the day, I think. Uh, it worked out well, and I'm still working for Cloudbase right after two and a half years nearly. So I think I, I can say I, I'm happy, but I think it was a big shock for many people on the team, right? It's just a different yeah. culture, you know, that, right? It's just very different. Um, I didn't expect that. I expected that I would struggle much more. At the end of the day, I was, I think, much more flexible personally um, that I'm not CEO anymore, and now I'm I'm an employee and that was totally fine for me. I think other people just struggled more because we always had a strong culture and a strong identity and people really identified themselves with and they were very proud of what they built with CodeChip. And it was still CodeChip, but not really anymore. And the culture was slightly different. And, and I think that was not good for many people. And then people started leaving at some point, which I guess is normal in an acquisition. It was nice, obviously. Yeah, um, did, did 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 most people leave Cloudbees eventually? Uh, I think I have to look at the numbers, but I probably I think two third left, one third is still there, or maybe it's like one quarter is still there. But yes, I mean that's again, I, for tech companies that's pretty good. Even if you just hire an employee yeah. normally, they usually leave pretty quickly. Like there's a high turnover generally. Yeah, I, maybe I just fell. Yes, I think if you look at the numbers and all of that, it's all good. It's right. I mean, and and. Some people found other jobs that made them much more happier. Some people found jobs and were even more frustrated there, but then took other jobs again. So I'm like, it's all good. I probably just thought my expectation was, oh, this will all be great and we will work hard on making it work. But in reality, some things are just outside of your control uh, and you have to accept it. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Um, it's been an hour. Cool. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. These. Is there any last words that you want to leave people with who are listening? <laughs> no. <laughs> I no. I talked it off. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair um, enough. No. no, that was fun. Um, it's, it's funny um, because I haven't talked about it in a while. It's always very, you, you, you start to reflect um, yeah. quite a bit of those conversations, which is fun. Yeah. yeah. I, I People really enjoyed it. From the comments I've seen, everybody loved it. So. You did a good job. Boy. <laughs> you told everybody how hard it is to start a startup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't do this. <laughs> no, I actually, very, I actually, very, very rewarding. in a way, saying don't start a startup is a good way of filtering out the people that aren't sort of tough enough to do it, if that makes any sense, I think. Right? It's yeah, like, and I think, I mean, yeah, there's the don't do what you love. Yeah. It's like, I love that quote. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly all right uh, i'm gonna end the stream here thanks for tuning in everybody uh if you enjoyed this you should follow moritz on twitter um at moritz Plasnik. i'm gonna send this i'm actually gonna send this link into the chat right now um he's super cool 
most of the time. Sometimes you are annoying. <laughs> <laughs> you you said that, not me. Um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. Awesome. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for having me. Bye.